All right, welcome to second week of instruction. We are going to begin with this dude. Leon Bautista Alberti, who did a number of remarkable things in the Renaissance that we're going to get into today. Um, and not the least of which is, I want to introduce this notion that's going to repeat itself uh, throughout the course of the semester. And probably for those of you that decide to continue to, to study architecture in your academic career and uh, hopefully go on to become uh, architects professionally uh, and commit yourselves to the craft as I have for since I was eight years old and I'm 42. So, you know, 35 years or so I've been kind of, my mind has been interested in uh, this thing called architecture and I continue to be, and I always have considered myself a student of architecture. I'm uh, learning every day as much as I'm doing. And I've certainly had a lot of wonderful opportunity to do some really interesting uh, architecture, both interesting as design and interesting as design that has been built. Uh, and I'm very proud of that work. And I look forward to continuing to do more of that work. Um, but I also really enjoy learning about architecture, whether it's the technical aspects of it, uh, the historical aspects, the theoretical aspects. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's an exciting, um, it's an exciting field and it's a very rich field and it's an in-depth field. Um, and what, what the idea that I want to introduce with Alberti, which I believe sets him apart as one of the sort of goats, if you will, if any of you are sports fans, uh, sort of great, you know, we use the term goat oftentimes when we're talking about some of the best athletes in, in history, which I suppose that term is used in other walks of life as well, music, etc. cetera. But um, Alberti is really is one of the, the, the luminary figures in architecture. I believe the reason that he's considered one of the luminary figures, the, I don't know, 10 or 15 kind of greatest names in the history of architecture. What sets him apart is not that he's done better work than others who are not in that group, because there's hundreds and thousands of architects that have done magnificent work in the history of, of the civilized world. What I believe sets him apart is that he's one of the few, the unique, who has taken the time to not only do great work and refine his skills and abilities to become a master architect and a great architect, but he also took the time and was articulate enough, and I suppose educated enough in the first place, to be able to write down and tell us his values and his ideals and how he went about creating the architecture that he created, um, as well as how he believes others who follow him should endeavor to take on the ideas of architecture, which is really to say that he wrote and not all architects who have done great work like Alberti took the time to write. The ones who have, have become sort of thought of as the upper echelon or the most luminary figures in architectural history. So that's one of the things that makes Alberti uh, unique. Uh, quick, quick, uh, actually a double book plug that I want to do. So this is Alberti's kind of magnum opus writing. He, 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 was a, he was a writer. He was a real, we're going to get into him in a minute and you, you'll, you'll see all the different things that he did besides architecture, one of which was writing. Uh, and he did write quite a bit, but this is the sort of biggest work of his, which is De Re Edificaturia, which is on the art of building. And it's, it's a fantastic book. I'm actually 
starting to reread it now. And he, he gets into sort of, he, he, he gives architectural architecture a theoretical basis for the first time. There is a canonical book that uh, was, was written before Alberti's Dere Edificaturia, which is Vitruvius's uh, what's called the 10 books on architecture. Vitruvius, it, it, Vitruvius's book is a little bit different. And I don't, you know, although it's considered, I guess, a, uh, one of the, the first probably architectural theoretical book, it's different in that it's very kind of scientific and, and kind of codifies the sort of proper way to mix lime and mortar and uh, sort of proper orientation when you're doing a, um, a house in the countryside versus a palace in the town. Alberti it gets into a lot more of the sort of proportional underpinnings, the, um, the, the humanist principles that drive the endeavor of architecture. In addition to getting into the technical aspects, he gives a lot of the sort of, this is what I believe an architect should be endeavoring to do. And this is the sort of... Um, expression that that he or she should be endeavoring to evoke when it's a the, the two big things are for me are this idea of uh, gravitas and festivitas so when you're when you're building for the nobility in the town the architecture should have gravitas it should have a formal um, the, the symmetry, the rhythm, the proportions should be a more formal um, proportion. It should evoke a more formal um, feeling versus when you're building a, a sort of um, a summer house in the countryside, um, it should have festivitas. That's the place to maybe be a little bit more playful, be a little bit less formal. Uh, maybe the portico isn't raised, you know, seven, eight steps above the ground plane. Maybe the the rhythm of the symmetry, uh, I'm sorry, the rhythm of the of the front facade isn't so uh, regimented. Maybe there's a little bit more playfulness of, you know, like two one 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 two one 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 in terms of the, the symmetry or the the proportion or the rhythm. Um, and he gives us kind of that idea that like when we're doing something here, we should endeavor to practice a different, uh, in, in one way. And when we're doing something in another place, which uh, evokes a different set of kind of feelings and brings a different, um, use to the space, the architecture should support that difference in use. Um, and so it's a, it's a seminal book. I highly recommend, uh, you reading it. You don't necessarily have to read it throughout the course of the semester, although it's a perfect time to be reading the book. Um, uh, do find time in your career to read it at some point because it's a very important book. Um, the other one, which is I only read for the first time maybe three or four years ago, and I and I picked it up because I kept seeing it, I kept hearing it referred to in in lectures. There are lots of really really good lectures online, and the first time I actually taught this course, I don't know, two or three years ago. Um, I started to kind of study by looking at what other professors who have far more uh, architectural, historical uh, training and background than I do. I mean, I'm just an architect and a, and a, and a nerd about architecture history that um, has sort of guided myself in addition to my education has kind of guided myself to maybe having a little bit more than average understanding about some of this stuff um, in comparison to maybe other practicing architects. Um, but, you know, not at the level of some of the professors that teach at the, the finest architecture colleges across the country and the world. So one of the first things I did is, is, is um, start to uh, look at some of the, the lectures that are available online of people that teach kind of this time period in architectural history. And I kept hearing people refer to the Wittkover text and Rudolf Wittkover and principles uh, of, of humanism that Wittkover talks about. And he does, and I believe he's deceased now, but he was, he's a 20th century author um, who wrote, ex studied extensively and, and really got into the detail of studying the drawings, the facades, the plans 
of some of the works of the Renaissance architects, Alberti included, Brunelleschi included, uh, Palladio, and just, you know, the full, the full gamut of the architects that were uh, relevant in that kind of six or 700 year time period. And he gets into uh, like deep kind of studies of like mathematical proportion um, or uh, repetition of various rhythms that um, he finds in not just the plan, but that carries itself out that same kind of proportional system that the architect is using to establish the spacing of the columns or the width of the side aisles or the width and the height of the nave is translating in facade also using the same kind of proportions in the ideas. So the Vitkover text, I would say, and it, and it's a, it's a, actually a much easier read, a shorter read than the Alberti text, although there's parts that, that I have had to myself read five or six times before I really understand what he's saying. Um, but this is a really, really good book and I highly recommend it. So Architecture, Architectural Principles in the Age of Humanism by uh, Rudolf Vitkover. Again, neither of these are required texts for the course, but you know, if you're, if you're interested in this stuff, um, those are, they're important readings. Okay, uh, just kind of 30 second review of what we've talked about in the prior lecture, which is a deeper dive. Brunelleschi's work, people, uh, Filippo. Uh, we go into a little bit of Michelozzo's work, who's kind of, uh, I would say, the bridge between Brunelleschi and Alberti, who we're going to get into, um, who we're going to get into today. So, uh, and I will, I didn't have a chance to, on the last lecture, do a reading of the syllabus, which actually I should probably just get out of the way right now. Uh, I'm sorry, not the syllabus, but the rubric for the exams and the essays. I'm going to read through the rubric, literally tell you how I grade the essays and the exams. Um, and then at the end of the lecture, I will actually read an example from a prior semester exam. And by the way, this file is available. Uh, it is on Canvas, so you can find it there anytime. But uh, since we're here, I'm just going to post it here on screen and kind of read through it with you. Which uh, this is when the assignment, the assignment isn't always worth 250 points. I believe this is the rubric when it's a final or when it's the final, it will be worth, I believe, 250 points. Don't quote me on that, but that's how this was set up. Um, I was grading on the final exams and it, on the final exam, it was worth 250 points in this case. And really, I'm looking for these five categories, A, B, C, D, E. In A, I'm, first of all, just like out the gate, 50% of the credit you get on the assignment, provided you respond to the three prompts, which is that you actually make an attempt to answer the question, I see, I feel, and this is important to us in architecture because, so when it's I see, you should be telling me, I see a dome, I see an octagonal tholobate, I see a brick clad exterior dome, I see a cupola, I see a symmetrical facade, I see a rise up to enter the building into the north, whatever it is. As long as you're providing what it says here, three coherent college level sentences, and you're using three, this is, I guess, a subtle distinction on the exam. I do ask you to use the three vocabulary words from the chapter terms. Um, I don't necessarily require that on the essays. So as long as you use three coherent college level sentences and you make an attempt to tell me what your eyes are seeing when you look at the work that I'm asking you to respond to, you're de facto getting 50% of the credit. Um, Part B is the sort of historical identification. And here it says to cite the name and the function of the building is worth 7%. To cite the architect is worth another, another 7%. And cite the year of construction is another 7%. I'll tell you right now, and I try to be consistent. And if you find an inconsistency in what I'm saying, please call me on it. But as I've said, I don't, I don't, 
emphasize you telling me exactly the year that a building was built or exactly the name of the architect or the birth year, the death year of that architect. So I want to be consistent. What I mean by site year of construction, I will always give 7% of the credit if you tell me this was built in the first half of the 14th century or it was built in the middle of the 16th century or was built at the end of the 19th century. As long as you generally can pin the building within a 20 or a 30 year time period, I'm good and I'm going to give you the credit because what that tells me is you're able to identify the building as a Renaissance building or a Baroque building or a uh, international style building or a postmodern era building. Um, so I don't care so much whether you know it was built in 1983. I care that you understand that it's an example of postmodern architecture and it was built in the back half of the 20th century. That's good enough. Cite the architect. I mean, it's an architecture history course. Um, it's important to know the architect. I mean, I don't. You don't need to say it's uh, Filippo Brunelleschi, born in such and such year, died in such and such year. You can say it was Brunelleschi. You can say it was Michelangelo. You can say it was Bramante. You can say it was Borromini. Fine. Um, just give me generally an idea that you know the architect that did the building. Um, and site name and function of a building, basically tell me, is it a church? Is it a basilica? Is it a town hall? Is it a museum? Um, just help me convince me that you know what we're looking at because you rec recognize the building because you saw it in the lectures and you studied it for a few minutes um, you know, before taking the exam or before writing the essay. Okay, part C, which is critical analysis and observation. This is important, and I'm starting to see this in the comments. So I'm really, really happy with, with kind of how we're starting on this course already. So, you know, great job for, for all of you that have been responding to the prompts and sharing your insights. Um, but really what I'm looking for is as college students, as adults, and as critical thinkers, I'm looking to see that you're able to make critical analysis and observation, oftentimes your own observations. Um, so in your response, are you able to say, uh, when I look at Santa Maria del Fiore, I see a prominent dome? That tells me a number of things already. You can identify that, although the facade itself is very ornate and has the sort of ablack, you know, the two color marble, uh, rose windows, and a lot of decoration and ornamentation, as we've learned, the Romanesque building is not really what that building is known for. What it's known for is the dome. And so it's prominent in its proportion. It's prominent in the sort of juxtaposition of color and materials against the Romanesque building. It's prominent in terms of its endeavor, what we were trying to do. They were trying to basically recreate the, uh, the Pantheon or the a dome as, as great as the Pantheon. Um, so it tells me that you're able to kind of understand critically and observationally what's happening in the, in the, in the architecture that you're looking at. Um, and then this is kind of where you're getting into the, this is important in architecture because what about it makes it important? Um, I try to give you four five, oftentimes six things on everything that we're looking at as to why it's important or what makes it relevant. I don't need you to give me all six of those back. Give me one of them. There's your 10%. One thing, remember one thing about why that building was important. Part D, which is position within. Uh, this is also very important to me, and this is worth 10% of, of the total grade, which is that are you demonstrating to me? I mean, we can't, you know, get in airplanes and fly to these buildings. If we could, gosh, I would love to do that, and I would love to just, you know, explore these buildings with you and, and kind of, ask you and listen to your kind of responses to what you're feeling as you move through this space, what kind of um, impact it's having uh, on you um, in terms of your, your sensory experience. Uh, obviously we can't do that, but by looking at images and certainly by studying those buildings and spaces on the internet, it, through your book and just kind of self-guided research, are you able to put yourself in that space and start to kind of understand 
what the scale of it is, what the feel of it is, what the light quality of it is, what the absence or presence of rhythm is doing in that space. Are you putting yourself in that space? Um, uh, and I'll actually I'll post a really, really fun uh, video uh, about that notion of, of, of getting within the architecture. It's a John Haydick, uh, John Haydick, um, uh, quick little snippet from an interview that he did. Um, so as it says, does the response show a, or I, a perspective of you having entered the space or being in front of the work and having experienced the space, um, focusing on the effect that, that it might have on you or that it has had on you if you've seen the building or if you've experienced the building. Um, and then last section E is exceptional. And that's really kind of the last 9%. Um, so, you know, if you did all those things up until that point, you're at a 91%, you're already at an A. But if, you know, you're you're one of those types of students, and I, I certainly, I celebrate this and I encourage this, but, you know, if you don't, if 91 is not good enough for you and you're striving for 100 or a 98 or a 97, uh, this last bit is what kind of puts you in that exceptional category is does the response show an exceptional writing quality? So are you an, are you like re really good at writing? That's half of it right there. Doesn't even require necessarily uh, extended architectural knowledge about the work. But uh, is is your writing like really does it flow really well and is it very convincing? And do you kind of support your claims by kind of backing it up with one or two kind of factual um, citations about it. And the second part of that, or the second half of that is, is there in, in, outstanding insightful observation? So I'm trying to help you with this when I, and it's already happened. I, I don't know how many I've responded to maybe 17 or 18 different comments that you guys have made on the work that we've looked at so far, but, and it happens all the time. It happens every semester and it's already happening now. Some of you will, will bring an insight that it has just never occurred to me, even though I've looked at these these buildings and these images for, you know, years now, multiple times, you know, 50, 100 times some of these buildings I've seen over the course of the years, uh, either in my studies or in teaching the, the material. There's still things that that are new insights that you guys are offering that I'm thinking, wow, what a fantastic insight. That idea has never occurred to me. Um, so is there kind of something outstanding and insightful observation that you're making that's not just a repeat of what the book told us or what I told you or what Wikipedia is telling you, but is there kind of something, something new that you're bringing as an insight, as, a, as an individual, as a, as a thinker, as an architect yourself? Um, so that's the rubric. And I will, I will read an exemplary essay uh, before the end of this lecture. Gosh, I'm already at 22 minutes. Okay, I'm going to have to probably break Alberti up into two, two lectures. But let's launch because the dude was phenomenal. All right, we're going to talk about, we already talked about Dere Edificatoria, which is fantastic. Okay, so we were talking about Palazzo Medici Riccardi by Michelozzo at the end of the last lecture, which is a, actually a really good place to start this lecture on Alberti's work, which is a very similar building to the, um, the Michelozzo uh, building, which was for the Medici family. This one by Alberti is for the Ruscellai family, and it's referred to as Palazzo Ruscellai. This is the first building, so I'll, I can, I'll do a kind of a quick primer. Uh, we're going to talk about Palazzo Ruscellai. We're going to talk about uh, Temple. So that's the only non-ecclesiastic um, building that we're going to look at by Alberti. The next four are all religious buildings, ecclesiastical commissions. Uh, so Palazzo Ruscellai, domestic building. Uh, Tempio Malatestiano. Uh, San Sebastiano. Uh, Sant'Andrea in Mantua. And the sort of... Um, culminating piece, the sort of thing that Alberti is probably most known for, which is, pardon me, which is Santa Maria Novella. And those five projects, including a sixth project you could consider, Dele Edificaturia, his writing work, his theoretical writing work, all six of those take place between a period of 1446 and end in about 1470. So over this like 25 year period 
this man makes these five, six magnificent works of architecture and this seminal um, writing. Okay, so let's jump into Palazzo Ruscellai. Palazzo Ruscellai is built 1446 through 1451, so pretty quick construction relative to some of the other stuff that we've been studying and will be studying. Um, and it is, like I described with the Medi Michelozzo's Medici uh, Palace, it is uh, tripartite. You probably can see that now if you remember from the prior lecture. Sorry, I'm going to move the microphone a little closer here. Uh, so tripartite facade. We see a, a taller ground level, but it's clearly separated and defined by, uh, by the string course or the belt course from the mid-level. And again, uh, upper string course or belt course or entablature string course, separating the mid-level from the upper level. And if you remember from the first lecture, I, I was beginning to talk about the um, deep pediment on the Michelozzo building, but I was mistakenly remembering my notes. It's really the Palazzo Ruscellai by Alberti that has the sort of deep kind of heavier pediment that's projecting from the building a little bit more than the ordinary pediment would have been projecting from the building. Um, I also made reference to this idea of trabiated affect, not literally trabiated. And this is a really, really good example of it. And you can see kind of Alberti, um, I don't want to say struggling, but kind of taking on this, this sort of challenge of architectural expression of making the building look as though most trabiated buildings look, which is that we can clearly see a column is holding up a horizontal member. Post and beam is another way to think about trabiated. Well, this isn't literally a trabiated building because we know uh, for fact that this building, the, the walls themselves are load-bearing, which means that the load is not coming down through only this surface and this surface of the wall. It's actually transferring down to the ground through the entire surface of the wall. But what Alberti has done is through plaster and stone relief carving into the front facade, he's giving the building the look of being trabiated by expressing and giving the look of a pilaster or even maybe a column on the facade where really there is no column there. And even dotting them uh, you know, at the top with capitals which I believe in my slides for this lecture, we're going to get into another unique thing that Alberti is doing here, which isn't new, but regardless fascinates me both in Alberti's work and when it's been done in the past. And it's been most was most prominently done on the Colosseum, the Roman Colosseum, which I'm sure you all know. And that's the idea, the usage of the simpler, more, I guess, the less formal, the festivitas order, which is the Tuscan order on the ground floor of the building. You can see in the capital, the lack of detail here, the more detail here, and the highest amount of detail here. So we're going from basically Doric to a modified, I would say modified Doric, simplified Doric even, po possibly a Tuscan, we'll get into that in a minute, uh, to a simplified Ionic, to a, what maybe even that's a simplified version of the Corinthian, but it's certainly more elegant and more detailed than this, and that's certainly more detailed and, and ornate than the bottom level. And so that's also signing and telling you something about what's happening in the building. This is where the building meets the street. This is the Piano Nobile where the family would receive guests and people would really enter the sort of private part of the building. Uh, and then really up here is where the, the private um, dormitories would be. <clears throat> we... Um, we see in the archways, I want to talk about the, um, I'm not going to pronounce this word right. It's a French word. I think it's vosours, vosours, V-O-U-S-S-O-I-R-S. Uh, for me, it's the keystone, which is basically the top 
stone um, that if we were actually literally building an arch, that top stone would be the, the piece that actually takes all of the pressure um, and keeps the arch uh, standing. So we see sort of expression of those guys here in the center of the arches um, we talked about the plan, plan. Oh, I'm sorry. On this building, the ground floor would have been the bank, uh, not merchant spaces. Uh, we talked about the projecting cornice. Oh, and also again, the look of kind of, um, even though there's more polish here than there was in Palazzo Medici Riccardi here at Palazzo Ruscioli, we are seeing still a differentiation between the lower level, the mid level and the upper level. Here, more so than anything, it's in the proportion of the stone. You see the wider, um, larger, more coarse-looking stone lintels represented in the lower section. And when we move to the upper sections, the expression of those courses are uh, not as tall, not as large, and more slender and horizontal, which in effect is also kind of emphasizing the horizontality of the building as it moves across as well, as does the belt course and the string course, and as does the pediment across the top. Um, okay, so that's um, Palazzo Ruscioli. Okay, let's get into the now the church architecture. Um, this one is Tempio Malatestiano, uh, and I it's in Rimini in Italy. And I believe the Malatestiano is a reference to the, um, to the person who commissioned it. I'm not sure, and it doesn't really matter whether it was the Pope or a Cardinal or one of the wealthy families of the city at the time, but ultimately any one of those three and all three of those were benefactors for architecture, civic architecture. They were the wealthy or the, um, the, the people that controlled the budgets in the, in the church or in the papacy. And so they were the ones that had access to basically give money to the architects to design and build uh, some of these wonderful buildings that um, history has given us. So the uh, it's Sig Sigmundo Pandolfo Malatesta. Um, again, not sure whether he was a pope or a cardinal or just a wealthy merchant in Rimini, but he's the one who commissioned. And this is really um, Alberti's first uh, religious commission, church commission. Okay, so a lot of interesting things are happening here. I want to kind of focus on the two or three important ones. So uh, this, first of all, it's the site of a prior existing church. The church is here before. And really, Alberti's job is to convert the church into a mausoleum for uh, Malatesta, which as I'm, as I'm remembering that, I'm remembering from the book reading that the, um, the reason this is going to be a mausoleum is because he, I, I believe he was a military general of some, some kind. And... Um, uh, he wanted to build this for, I believe, him and his mistress, if I'm not mistaken, um, to be buried here. And so um, uh, white marble is the primary material being used. But what, uh, what has always fascinated me about this project, and it, it's, it's incomplete. So there was the intent to actually, and, and we'll see Alberti's design for the completion of this facade, but what you can see here is, you know, either something missing or deliberately left off here. And then even here, the kind of, you know, stopping at mid construction of the uh, surface along the facade of the um, uh, probably the, the pilaster that matches one of those, as well as the pilaster, the new pilaster, the Alberti Alber Alber pilaster that's being applied has also kind of stopped you know, two thirds of the way up and maybe halfway up here. We'll see a picture of what the completed was supposed to look like. But despite the fact that it's incomplete, we already are seeing what is happening here and here. This is kind of a very important thing compositionally that Alberti is starting to 
explore. And that's the idea that if we, if we literally went back to the Greeks, if we did a la antica and went back to classical antiquity, and if you think about the Parthenon, for example, what you would see is a single piece pediment, a single triangular element that has a diagonal to a point and back down to a point and an entablature across the top. And that entire thing would read as one kind of primary frontispiece. Alberti's starting to mess with that idea. He's starting to say, what if I could kind of cut the pediment, separate the pediment pieces from another, and intersect that with another central section that may be the width of the bay of the entry piece? And maybe by doing so, I'm able to emphasize, again, this is kind of think about plan and elevation together here, but maybe by doing so, I'm able to emphasize the central section which is the nave, which is the most important part of the building, and de-emphasize the side aisles of the building to sort of tell you, again, this is coming up a lot now, but for the, in order to allow the building to sign, to show somebody on the outside what is happening on the inside. So um, that's one of the things that's going on here. The other thing that we're starting to see is, uh, and this is considered a blind arcade, and this is why I remembered that it was a mausoleum, is that I believe um, Malatesta and his mistress, or Malatesta and his mistress, or could have been his mistress and his wife, I don't remember, but the people that were intended to be buried here, this was done as a blind arcade so that their um, their basically bodies could be could be could be kept behind the blind arcade. I think in the end, they ended up not going there in either under or, or in one of the rear spaces. But nonetheless, Alberti's intent was that this would be, um, again, an indication from the outside of what's going on on the inside. There's this semicircular arch that's you know symmetrically offsetting left and right of the entry piece. We know that's where we enter the building. Um, but where we would ordinarily expect maybe a window or another door to be, there's this kind of blind thing, although the, the outline of it is still there. So he's telling us something's happening here and I've deliberately left out a window. And in this case, he's replaced it with the body of the man that um, you know commissioned the piece in the first place, who's for whom the building was built. Um, the third thing I wanna point out here is uh, is almost a direct reference to a la antica, which is um, the idea of the the victory arch. Um, so there's the arch of Constantine. I think Trajan had an arch. These are kind of going back now to the uh, ancient Roman Empire um, and the use of the arch as a marker celebrating a victory in a war or a defeat of an enemy um, and so as we're building new architecture now and our focus is on religious architecture in this time frame, primarily, we're not forgetting the architecture of the same empire's kind of past era, but rather we're actually trying to weave some of that into our new architecture. So you're seeing here in the central entry piece what looks like the start of or a, an homage to um, the um, arch of arc of arch of Constantine, the entry arch. Uh, and I'm sorry that I don't have um, the arch of Constantine here in this slide deck, but look it up, or maybe you you, you remember it anyway. Uh, okay, so blind arcade, white marble, arch of Constantine. Uh, and the split pediment we talked about at the top. Okay, so here's an illustration, a depiction, and it was actually supposed to have a dome as well, which never happened. But there's a kind of an elevation depiction of what you don't see. So this is what I was trying to point out is that if you look at kind of Greek classical architecture, this form of having a triangular shaped pediment topping the primary floor of the building would not have been uncommon. But Alberti is kind of in trying to invent something new off of that idea, which is what if I can kind of take that, break it, split them apart, and have it kind of intersected by this, this central element that elongates and emphasizes more the center portion of the building. 
So I think what ended up is they got buried in these side crypts and not here, which is where the blind arcade was that you were looking at on the outside. Here's the kind of rear apse and the ambulatory. And this is basically the nave. So you can kind of, you can almost read this and these in plan as being this and these off to the side. So nave, side aisle, side aisle, nave, side aisle, side aisle. Building is showing you on the outside what's on the inside. I hope that makes sense. Okay, third, San Sebastiano. I'm at 40 minutes. I'm going to kind of jam through these. San Sebastiano. Um, this is built 14... Uh, Malatestiano is 1450, the prior one. I think I may have left that date out. So Tempio Malatestiano, Leon Battista Alberti in Rimini, 1450. San Sebastiano, the next commission up. This is in Mantua, also in Italy. And this is kind of the first example of a central plan church. So until now, we're kind of inheriting basilica form churches or building something that is a more simplified, um, sometimes a more ornate version of a rectangle or a basilica, but not often building central plan churches, which is that it's a church that has a clear kind of center, not necessarily because it's radial in form, but because it has a transept and a long nave and the midpoint is considered the sort of cent central element of the church. Um, so this is the first kind of example of a central, the, the, uh, focusing on the central plan idea, which is that there's a clear center here and there's these four kind of equal elements projecting off of the center. And then there's the sort of narthex and the entry portico so that one could enter the building. But once somebody gets past this point, the front doors of the building, it's really central in the sense that, you know, there's a defined center and there's basically four equal legs radiating off that center. Um, similar thing here where he's breaking, he's, he's, you know, kind of playing with the pediment. He's kind of like messing with this to see what he can do, what he can come up with at Malatestiano he was literally kind of splitting it apart and interjecting it. Here, he's basically splitting the bottom portion apart and, and kind of decorating it with this semicircular motif within the entablature, or within the pediment directly on top of the entablature. And then, just in case you didn't notice what I'm doing here and you didn't notice what I'm doing here, I'm going to set a window to also <laughs> mark that space just to really call your attention to what I'm doing here. Um, so, you know, he's, he's exploring, it's not refined, but it's not supposed to be refined because he's really the first one kind of testing out these, these new ways of, um, putting classical geometry, uh, back together in, in a way that makes it interesting and new or exciting for him. Another really unique thing that's happening here is this is one of the first examples where we see the approach to the upper level. And this is uh, like the prior one where uh, it was intended to be a mausoleum. The lower level of this building it was built, is built as a crypt. And so really, uh, but it's not a, a lower level in the sense that it's primarily below ground. It's pretty much the ground level. And so what that means is in order to get into the church level, the nave level, you almost have to climb an entire floor. Uh, which is unique in and of itself. But what makes this especially unique is that Alberti is pushing the entrances from what usually would be in the front to really the two sides. So we're ambulating or we're arriving at the upper level, the, the um, primary level of the church, the nave level where we can go in. We're arriving from the wings, not from the center. I believe this was originally designed for the entire front to be the steps going up. I don't know what that means about how we would have gotten to the crypt, but that was, I believe, Alberti's original plan, which actually you see in his next work. I didn't even realize that connection between um, 
San Sebastiano and San Andrea, which is that next slide that you just saw here. Um, but I thought I had a picture of... Oh, I, I, that's right. The proof was in the plan. So if you see here, this is, I think, a representation of the original plan of the church, which is this entire thing would have been the steps leading up. And what you're seeing here are the one, two, three, four, five doorway openings, which is the one, two, three, four, five would have been ways to get into the building after you uh, climb up the steps. In the time since, these three have been kind of closed off, uh, probably maybe to give access from here rather than wherever the original access may have been from. But these still serve as the entrances off to the side, so the winged entrances. Um, okay, so that's San Sebastiano, 1460. We talked, oh, and, and really in the other you really unique thing, and I'm glad I, I caught this before I moved too far ahead. The other really unique thing about San Sebastiano is that if you notice, he's not using any columns, like literally columns on the building. And in fact, there's very little even expression of pilaster. It's very, very subtle difference between this facade plane and that facade plane and here and here and even here and here. So yes, the pilaster is present, giving us the effect of a column, but there is actually no columns on this facade whatsoever. It's entirely wall. <clears throat> okay, fourth is Sant'Andrea. And this is again, a church uh, in Mantua. Um, and it was the site of an original monastery which Alberti was commissioned to basically put a facade on and expand and put an entry piece on. Uh, the Campanile, uh, which is part of the original Romanesque, um, uh, the Romanesque cathedral that was built, um, is still there. You can see in the image. Um, he used brick with hardened stucco, and you can actually see the, the brick here, uh, in the lower section, and then above it is a kind of a hardened plaster, which is to say that it's basically plaster, but that's been kind of um, hardened to kind of have a, a slightly smoother effect than uh, ordinary plaster would have. Um, large central arch. So what he's doing here is he's really kind of elongating and pulling up vertically and giving us a two-story opening to a single-story double doorway. Um, but he's basically, and again, you should you probably can see here um, the reference to kind of ancient Roman architecture and the idea of the sort of victory arch or, or Constantine's arch that as is, is being, he, he's kind of paying respect to the, the, the Roman era before in this new building, which is really for this new kind of holy Roman empire or Christianity or Christendom, which is what the building is celebrating, but saying, I haven't forgotten our ancestry and you know what great things we accomplished as, um, as a military power, if you will. <clears throat> the pilasters, barrel vault. So this is a, uh, we've talked about the, the groin vault, which is really uh, the, as a result of the intersection of two barrel vaults with one another. Here you see literally just a barrel vault, basically the arch that's extruded through uh, with coffering in it, which is what gives it a direct reference to the Arch of Constantine. Um, I mean, we've gone over these terms, but this is a helpful diagram just to kind of reiterate when we talk about the triangular piece at the top, we're talking about the pediment. The pediment rests off most, most often on top of an entablature which is made up of a frieze and, and, ped and um, a cornice and egg and dart pattern often. So there's the entablature can be broken down into five other kind of constituents parts, but in, in, you know, in its entirety, all of those elements together make up the entablature and the entablature will rest on either literally columns or pilasters, or it could be just a solid wall across and the entablature above. There's a view of the inside. So you can actually read this barrel vault uh, form 
it pulls through, even though it kind of stops at this wall, not kind of, it literally stops at that wall. It does carry itself on through the inside. This is, uh, gosh, I can, I'm inclined to just kind of pause on this image and let you guys just sort of take it in for a moment. I, I think the, the sort of juxtaposition of use of dark color, and there's not a lot of natural light in the front part of this space, uh, because it's so tall and because there's so much light coming from this space, it's in effect illuminating this part of the space. But if that dome wasn't there, this would be a, a fairly dark feeling space because there's not a lot of natural light and he's using a lot of dark color here. Um, what the saving grace is, is the volume is really tall. If that was, if it was half the volume with the color that is chosen and it had there not been so much natural light coming from the adjacent space, which is the, the transept where the, the nave and the, the crossing, the crossing where the transept and nave are intersecting. If there wasn't such a huge dome with such wonderful natural light coming through, this would be an otherwise dark space. But and so what I think one of the things that's intriguing for me about this space is and I've never been here. In fact, I've never been to Italy um, to see some of this this masterwork. I look forward to to one day uh, seeing these spaces in person. But um, I think one of the things that interests me about this image in this space is the juxtaposition of the dark against the light. And and the volume is just it's it's phenomenal. I mean, these are people. That's us. That's, you know, five and a half, six feet at most. So um, this, I think I talked about it maybe in the first or the second lecture, but we talk about transcending human scale. Alberti is transcending human scale with this, with this proportion. There's a view up at the underside of the coffered uh, ceiling of the entryway on the outside. There's a view of the barrel vault on the inside. If you look in the other way, this, oh, I did have a slide. This is kind of the, what, what we're trying to capture in the new work in the Renaissance when we're kind of paying our respects to uh, ancient Rome and the notion of the victory arches. Okay, this is the, not this one. Here's an example of a Corinthian column. Here's a breakdown. I'll come back to this slide in a second. I want to go to this one first. Okay, when I when we talk about the classical orders, first we'll, we're talking about these three, which the Greeks gave us. They basically codified the idea that there is a Doric, an Ionic and a Corinthian order. And each of these have different rules about the proportion of the width to the height of the um, height of the detail element to the width of the detail element to the height of the upper section, the capital, if you will, to the width of the capital. But all three orders have the three core elements, which is base, shaft, and capital. Base, shaft, capital. Base, shaft, capital. So these are the classical orders that came to us from the Greeks. What the Romans, the ancient Romans, added as a fourth and a fifth order are a simplification of the Doric, which is the Tuscan. You can see the sort of simplification of detail at the, at the base from a kind of a two-layer stacking disc to really kind of just a single layer um, and also even a simplification up here of there, there's a um, 
this is completely rounded and looks like it's maybe three layers and it's gone to basically a square capital with just one round layer underneath it uh, as the capital piece. So you see kind of a simplification. So they took the simplest and made it simpler. And then they took the most complicated and actually made it more complicated by introducing the composite order, which is basically these two smashed together to create a fifth one. What's always fascinated me about these five orders is that if you pay close attention to the Colosseum, the Colosseum basically starts with this order and ends with this order as you move from the ground plane up. So as the rings surround the Colosseum and the columns and the pilasters you see in the facade, look closely at them uh, when you have a moment and you should be able to read the kind of simple, medium, most complicated as the building moves up vertically. And as it engages the street, it's using the kind of simplest. And as it when it gets to the top where the gods, the sculptures of the gods are, uh, is where the, the most ornate um, is used. Okay, so this is kind of a breakdown of the elements of both Ionic and Corinthian and composite capitals. When we talk about a volute, we're talking about these rounded elements. Um, honestly, did not even know that space is referred to as a bell. Um, not sure that's important or that's going to come up. Uh, an abacus blossom is usually kind of um, sort of darted at the top center. This is the central helix where basically two volutes are kind of coming towards, towards us at the center element. Uh, the upper leaf um, or the foliage of the, uh, I think we often refer to these as agantha leaves. Um, so this is a, kind of an upper leaf detail and a lower leaf detail. So these are the, the kind of sub parts of a Corinthian or composite column. Again, just for our edification, not, I'm not gonna test on any of this stuff. Um, and then if you wanna kind of understand in a little bit more detail when I'm, um, talking about the various parts, you know, there's these, the entablature has the frieze, the cornice, um, not sure exactly what that section is referred to, the lower portion of the entablature, but I will look it up and, and get back to you guys for sure on the next lecture, um, which are the elements that basically top the column. So the column ends here, and then the entablature, the three parts of the entablature rest on top of the column. Um, okay, I'm at 50. Oh, there's a picture of the Colosseum. So there's the changing of detail and ornamentation as we move up in the layers of the column, uh, the Colosseum. Okay, I'm actually going to end there. So I'm going to break um, Alberti, which is probably suitable, uh, as great of an architect as Alberti was. Um, I'm going to cover the last of Alberti's work, which is this phenomenal building, Santa Maria Novella. Uh, I'm going to cover it in the next lecture. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get to the reading. This is the second time now I didn't get to a reading of the exemplary essay. What I will do for you all is I'll actually scan and post it on Canvas so that you guys can have a chance to look at it before Tuesday. And I'm going to tell you now and I'll post another short video to announce this, but the essay that I want you all to write that's due Tuesday, which is I see, I feel, and this is interesting or relevant to us in architecture because I would like you to write on This building. So your first essay, you're going to write about this building, what you see, three sentences, 
what you feel, three sentences, when you look at this or when you imagine yourself walking through it or walking around it or walking along the street and looking at it. So you, what you see, what you feel, and why this is interesting and relevant to us as architects. I'll post a really short video formally announcing it as a separate, but just wanted to kind of put that out uh, with the end of this lecture. Okay, thank you everyone. This is, um, this is actually really exciting stuff uh, and I'm excited to finish off with Alberti uh, with Santa Maria Novella in the next lecture. And then we're actually going to leave Europe and move into, uh, into Russia. Thank you.